Thanks for having me here. It's great to uh, come up from Norfolk, Virginia, just down the coast of ways, to uh, between Boston and Norfolk. There's very uh, many some some similarities, and I'll I'll talk about those. My background's in uh, working off the coastlines so of places where Brian has worked, and um, like we need to talk later. And he's got some great ideas while he was talking. Well, I'm going to talk about sea, sea, sea level rise, and really the phrase to think about is increased flooding because of uh, sea level rise. In our area, just like your area, has been in the news constantly. Uh, I've become, I'm on PBS and NPR and all these things all the time. The press always wants to come talk to us because we have some very, uh, we have some play places that flood constantly. Uh, I can't get to work uh, quite often because of the street floods in our neighborhood. So where is it happening? Uh, it's up and down our coastline. These little arrows pointing up are where sea level is rising. The red is not good. That's the highest rise rates. Uh, I'm pointing to the other places over in Norfolk and the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, uh, where it's also rising fast. And I'm going to tell you quite a bit about that. Uh, but the whole coastline is really experiencing sea level rise. You know, we're experiencing more coastal flooding. This is just a scene uh, in part of downtown Norfolk. It happens to be right next to the Chrysler Museum and about two blocks from the Opera House and this area floods just during normal high tides now. And it was like here in Boston, it was settled 400 years ago next to creeks and stuff and uh, we've seen four feet of sea level rise. <coughs> so we're um, dealing, that's, that's hours per year of, of flooding just in that one area where it starts to flood. I'm going to talk, talk to you about uh, local sea level rise as opposed to global and about some projections uh, why it's happening, and then about some projections that we just did for, uh, for Boston about three days ago. And then a little bit about what's going on in Norfolk and Virginia Beach, and it's really similar to here, and, and uh, some thoughts on how we deal with this. First, you know, why, why, is, why are we having this problem? This is just a schematic that shows to the directions right here. This is because of, it's called the glacial is isostatic adjustment. During the last glaciation, there was a lot of ice up in uh, this area and, and further north went down and the area from uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina went up. Now the ice is gone and uh, New York and uh, Quebec and there is going up and we're going down. And it's, uh, it's major, it's, it's, no, uh, uh, it's well, well known how this is happening. So the whole east coast between here and uh, North Carolina is subsiding because of this glacial ice that rebound. We have a really cool thing that you don't have. We have a 35 million year old impact crater you know, right at the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. And if you're a geologist, if you look at how the rivers kind of flow down and then take a jog, that, they, that happens because they're flowing into the old impact crater. Of course, it's not there now, but if, if you, uh, if they, they drill down and you, you can see the impact of it. But the result is the, the rock strata is all jumbled up and slowly readjusting, so we get a little bit of subsidence because of that. So we've got glacial ice and static subsidence, and we've got impact craters. And then we've got the Gulf Stream offshore, which is, is moving around. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit uh, in a second. But basically, we live next to a restless ocean that's warming up. There's ice melting, and it moves around. So what's happened in the last uh, six months or so? Uh, you see the word accelerating in the top paper, the middle hot spot of accelerated sea level rise, and sea level rise accelerating in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, first, Abby Salinger, who unfortunately died about a month ago, was a, a leading uh, researcher in this at the U.S. Geological Survey. And we had, uh, sadly, we all just started to work together, John Boone at the Virginia Suit Marine Science and uh, uh, where I am, all independently calculating acceleration rates. It's kind of science at its best. These groups are off doing their own thing and got together. Uh, and realized that we were all kind of coming up with the same same numbers and looking at acceleration rates. I'm going to show you a little bit of the detail. So first off is you, all, you hear about global sea level rise, and the color map shows where, where sea level is rising faster than other places. As Brian pointed out, it's, it's not just the bathtub isn't just fill, filling up. It's uh, part of the oceans are warming more than others, and there's a lot of circulation issues. So. But you can really forget about that. You've got to think about what the local sea level rise, and the plot on the left just shows that the red is kind of a global sea level rise, and, and the uh, blue line is local for our area, and you would look almost exactly the same. But if you look at global in the upper right, you can see that these are just all the global sea level stations, uh, 
uh, sea levels coming up just globally. But let's look, uh, you know, what's going on locally. And what we found is that the acceleration, this is just the Gulf Stream, the, the redder colors are warm water and the blue is cold water. Sorry, I didn't, it's almost up to Boston. What we found is in several papers now have shown that, that as the Gulf Stream slows down and moves offshore, sea level drops along the coastline. Uh, there's really good physical reasons for this. Uh, we understand that. So between the Gulf Stream slowing down a bit over time, which has happened since about 2006, sea level has started to drop. And we also think there's going to be other things like coastal currents and freshwater coming out of Labrador. Everything kind of adds up to sea level rise. It's kind of hard to come up with scenarios for sea level going down. And, and believe me, where I live, we, we would prefer to see it going down. Uh, the other thing that's happening, uh, hurricane, uh, sorry, Superstorm Sandy brought this up very clearly, but you know, things are changing in the ocean. There's more heat, uh, there's more moisture, there's, there's uh, less ice in the Arctic Ocean, so there's uh, more and more heat up there, so it's changing the weather patterns and the subpolar jets. Uh, and there's more moisture coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, which is what, you know, trenches you people a lot, and it's, that's where it's coming from, or the, or the Eastern Pacific. So we're seeing more of this. Uh, so we're seeing, in fact, in the lower left, I point out that uh, the study that's just about done now seems to show that the, the increased flooding that we've experienced along this coast during flooding events has been caused not necessarily by sea level rise, by, but by increased storminess. And it's all about the directions of the winds and, and their strength, uh, which points out it's really, because climate is kind of the, the coach, but it's the punch, it's the weather. This is okay, here's Boston. This is your tight gauge down somewhere. I don't know where that is, downtown. <laughs> <Somebody knows. coughs> anyway, you've got a record since 1920. That's great. Ours is uh, started in 1927. So keep funding NOAA to keep these tight gauges going because this is the only way we're gonna be able to predict what's going on. Anyway, you can see pretty clearly it's, it's going up at about uh, just a linear thing is 2.8 millimeters a year. This is, I just did a quick plot like I did down there. Uh, I looked at your last flood at, uh, on the coast here. Uh, it looks like this is, you can see that for hours per year, kind of street flooding in some areas it is, is going up, <clears throat> just like it is in our area. Okay, this is a little detail, but uh, it's worth looking at because it's very cool. <laughs> and if you get back to your trigonometry, remember you can add up sine and cosine and curves and you'll come up with Uh, is that a way to point? Yeah, on the, it's on the remote, yeah. on the remote. Yeah, it's just not, okay. Here's the curve here. That's sea level at that tight gauge. You can see it kind of goes up, it flattens out, and then it goes up again. So since about 1940, the sea level's kind of stayed kind of low. It hasn't accelerated up too much, and that's when a lot of the coastal construction was going on. You notice there's kind of a curve that does, it goes up and flattened up. Well, that, we can decompose all this. So there's a big 60-year 60, 60 cycle here that's pretty well known in the North Atlantic Ocean. We can decompose all this. So we can see all these different uh, signals in the ocean are adding up. But here's the long-term trend that's coming out of this, which is what we're in here, uh, you know, what we want to look at here. <coughs> this all also allows us to make longer-term predictions because eventually, about 40 years from now, this trend is going to start to slack off again. So we'll go through an acceleration phase and then we'll slack off a little bit. <coughs> so for, for Boston, the, the blue line is just extrapolating, the green is just your data, uh, the sea level, sea level data at that time gauge. And the blue line is just a linear regression of it. And the, the red line is, is a more sophisticated way to, analyze, to analyze it. Uh, so you can see the, the acceleration picking up here. So this is, uh, the top graph is a projection of where sea level is going to go up to 2050. And it's about one and a half feet. And there's two graphs show two different ways of calculating this. And they both come out about a foot and a half by, by 2050. That's about, we're getting a little more, we'll probably be. Uh, and, and this is run on thousands of, of uh, scenarios. It's not, not just a simple extrapolation. So a whole blue scheme. This is for Virginia. You've heard a lot of stories about Virginia, but in our, we're not quite like North Carolina. But um, this, this is being dealt with. This is a state report, 
And you know, the official projection is for our area is around two feet by 2050, and that, that's what the cities are starting, are planning on. Uh, so the bottom line, this is a neighborhood, actually this is about three blocks from our campus, on a kind of a higher, higher tide of that. Uh, coastal sea levels rising, there's just uh, no way around that. The, 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 we, we can predict the rate with a fair amount of confidence. Uh, coastal storms are becoming more frequent and more powerful, and, and for another talk, I gave a plug for ocean research. To understand and predict this, we're gonna have to understand the North Atlantic Ocean, because that's what's driving the acceleration. Uh, so why do we worry about this? Um, again, these are all from, I, I drive right by this. There's another house being jacked up yesterday I drove by there. But, uh, you know, they have to, planners have to know 20, 40, 60, 80 years out. Concrete and seawater lasts about 80 years, so the Navy just spent $500 million at the Navy base in our neighborhood, uh, raising up all the docks. So they have to, they're thinking 80 years, other, uh, you know, uh, other planners are looking at a shorter or longer term. Sewer outfalls are 20 to 40 years, that's what, what they're planning on. Uh, this was interesting, and this isn't really good data, but I just, yesterday, I wonder where all the airports are from Norfolk to, to here. Well, they're all in marshes except for Dulles. Uh, and they're all very, that picture is uh, uh, LaGuardia during Sandy with water on the runway and a welcome to New York City. Uh, they're all they're all low. Uh, and Hampton Air Force Base, uh, as far as the typo is, 11 feet in flood during Hurricane Isabel. So all the airports are, are uh, very close to sea level. You know, you think about how long does it take to move an airport. So there's a lot of fixed structure uh, that can't, you know, people in it will say we'll move. Well, they're just thinking of people that are having their beachfront homes and enjoying it, but there's other stuff. And the other stuff is, is uh, this, this is you know, Norfolk and Virginia Beach, and you brush all this to get down to Nags Head. That's Camp Perry, the farm, the CIA. This is a nuclear arsenal. It must be very large, it supplies all the fleet. This is the biggest Navy base in the world. This is all the stuff that supplies it. This is the Marine Expedition, or the Navy, the SEALs, the guys that got uh, Osama bin Laden. This is the place where they monitor all the sound and all the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it goes on and on. So this stuff isn't gonna move. Uh, so in our area, it's really national security may be something that becomes a factor for spending a lot of money to protect all this stuff. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure here you've got the same thing. Some things just kind of are going to be very hard to move. This is a neat story. Uh, the only uh, aircraft carriers, you know, you God knows what they cost now, are only built. There's one dry dock in, in Newport News area in uh, Northampton Roads that builds them. Uh, one dry dock, like 27,000 welders and shipwrights and stuff that probably all have security clearances. During Hurricane Isabel, that's water spilling into the dry dock. Uh, that's not good. So, um, so Northrop Grumman just did an internal study, you know, uh, saying, hey, we understand that it's going to be uh, sea levels rising, there may be more uh, flooding in the future, and the engineers came back and said, yeah, what, what occurred every 80 years is it's going to, in 50 years, it's going to occur every two years. Well, it takes 10 years to build a carrier, and they're planning 40, 50 years out. So they're now in the process of, you know, what do we do? And it's not like you move the carrier Garden Dry Dock to Richmond or something. So there's a, and there's an Air Force base nearby that flooded during uh, Isabel too, and it's evidently not, not movable. They also did a heat index study because they, they were outside bowling and stuff, and they, they calculated the number of uh, days they're going to lose each year due to what they call red flag days when they can't work outside. There's been a lot of reports done, uh, just so you're aware that the, the Corps of Engineers actually has got a new one out for 2013, but all the, all the construction approved done by the Corps of Engineers uh, has guidance for sea level rise built into it. And it's uh, kind of the same numbers we're used to at various place to place. <coughs> We've got our own internal re or, uh, report out for the state, and every state has this, all planning district commissions have done this. And there's, of course, federal reports are coming out left and right right now with the national assessment. So there's plenty of information, you know, we're, uh, and then uh, very locally, we're all also doing our sea level rise and just you know the other thing is a lot of this is just what has to be done to adapt it's just <coughs> some old stuff you know stormwater systems you know you don't have to know the only guy has to one thing about civil engineering water runs downhill and sorry engineers but there's one, there's one other thing you have to know but that doesn't apply here um, 
But we have a downhill, you know, the highest point's about 15 feet, so we pump everything. So where do you, where do you uh, put pumps, where do you put stormwater systems, uh, and so Dutch say, how do, you, how do you work with water? Uh, just one example, uh, this is just a bridge across the tidal inlet, uh, happens to be about three blocks from the major trauma center for all of eastern Virginia and North Carolina. The whole area floods badly, so the Dutch have come in, Fugro's the little company up in the corner there, a very, very large Dutch company, Concro, a, uh, a uh, British company, but they've actually given the city designs for uh, very large fixed barrages, uh, passages and stuff like this. Uh, and it just shows, uh, south of that yellow line you get flooded with salt water, and north of it you're going to get flooded with fresh water, take your pick. <laughs> Um, the catch is when you put in a barrage, and the same thing would apply here, you, you build a barrage across the inlet, but then you've got to run uh, walls all around the place to keep it from going around the edge. So, and these are happen to be very trendy neighborhoods, and so good news, you're not going to get flooded, but there's an eight foot wall running down the street uh, you can't see over. Uh, but these are all, you know, this is now public, uh, and they're now going through the process of what's, what's going to get done. And this is an example, I just, uh, there's a, I found on the web, this is, that's Boston, a big uh, system of barrages protecting the harbor. Uh, the guy who did this pointed out that this isn't probably a very good idea, because uh, you'll have a big freshwater lake. Uh, the same thing goes for, this is the Mount of, Chesa uh, Mount of Chesapeake Bay, you know, and obviously we could barrage that off and, and uh, turn the Chesapeake Bay into freshwater, that's not very good idea either. So there's going to be a lot of construction around here, both hard and soft, to protect areas. And that, that's, those are the kind of decisions that have, that we have to help people make. And then FEMA comes along and, you know, encourages risky behavior. Uh, you know, you get insurance, which is going to cost a lot of money next year, uh, to live in those areas. There's a Stafford Act that lets cities replace damaged infrastructure. So there's all kinds of, of federal and state policy set up to encourage this risky behavior, but then the president comes in, you know, with uh, Governor Christie and says, you know, we'll follow up to make sure you get help until you rebuild. So, that, you know, who wants to tell people they've got to leave the homes that they've lived in for several generations? So there's a lot of uh, uh, things that make this uh, hard to do, and of course there's, the head of FEMA speaks very openly about uh, uh, how this, this really has to change. And I guess you've heard of you in flood zone that FEMA next year, over the next five years, has to charge a rate that's actuarially sound. Uh, so FEMA does it for the money. So rates are going to go up by tenfold at least uh, for people that are in flood zones. Uh, there's a local group in College of William and Mary, and I don't deal with a lot at all, but uh, I was, it's fascinating when you start to hear uh, all the issues that come into the coast. You, you, uh, you know, you've got city law, state law, federal law. Uh, all the property rights issues, the taking issues, the hazard mitigation, interesting issues about uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, you jack something up 10 feet and then the ramp's got to be, you know, you need, can't even get the ramp because it's going to extend onto somebody else's property. Um, so I, I just want to briefly mention what we're doing locally. It's kind of, I, I'm here to partly get our faculty team up with people here. So. Uh, my role was, I asked, was asked by the university president, what's the role of our university in our community? And uh, so we went about finding faculty and see if they were interested. That's a street near our campus. Uh, and we've worked on a lot of different projects and put a lot of money up internally just to get, get people started. And believe it or not, we even did a poll of the Virginia legislators on their knowledge of sea level rise. And uh, once near the coast understand it, you go further away, they don't. Uh, we're doing our own modeling of our own campus, and uh, I wish I could get it, but just two days ago, the new master plan came out, and, and we met with them, and, and it's basically, we're going to have to build a baseball field, because it's the highest point of land on our campus. But all of our buildings from now on are going to have probably two floors of parking, and then up from there, we won't have anything on ground level. Um, that's also our neighborhood starts of there. So, one thing we've done is, uh, uh, we're a small, you know, it's one and a half million people in the, in the whole area. So these are all like, these are all the stormwater engineers. We just haven't been, one thing we're doing is providing them a, a way to talk without, uh, without the press around and the politicians just to go over their different challenges they have and best practices.
practices. And we've had uh, just lunches for people that have climate change and all this in their courses. I found that we had 65 classes that had case studies concerning climate change, but when you did a search of all the syllabi, you didn't see it, so you had to actually ask what they're doing. But we've had speakers in just like Tilly. Uh, Lindy Patton's a great speaker. You might have her in sometime. She, she's the chief climate products officer for Zurich. A whole uh, different view of the world. Uh, final thoughts. How am I on time? Oh, you gave up time? No, <laughs> Okay. Uh, the U.S. The whole urban coast from Norfolk to Boston is 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 going to see increased flooding, and it's going to be pretty dramatic. It's not like we haven't dealt with it before. Uh, these communities have been around here for 400 years plus. Uh, and show it, but the downtown Norfolk, the actual business financial district, is protected by a seawall and tide gates. And, and I think they said it was it was five million dollars to build that, and there's half a half a billion dollars worth of stuff protected by it. So it's economic development too. Um, so we have to, uh, and, and the feds, I'm um, going to say at the end, the feds are going to require uh, regional coordination, uh, not only within our region but within all the regions. And and when I got in this as a physical oceanographer, I, I guess within a, uh, probably days, I realized the science is done. We, we know what's going on. We can measure it. We can do pretty good predictions. Uh, is, and what the engineering has done is how much money you want to throw at it and, and what do you want to throw at. It's, it's the, uh, I'll say the biology is harder. I won't give you it. <laughs> <laughs> but the physics side of it is uh, we know how to do a pretty good job. But it's the people, you know, how you make decisions. So, you know, we have people in social marketing and, and uh, behavioral economics and decision sciences and risk engineering and the cool story about theater arts. Um, uh, and just how you, how you help people make these decisions uh, about moving their homes, uh, changing the whole, whole environment they live in. And just a lot of the infrastructure is not, not movable. So the, the knee-jerk reaction by, by somebody inland as well just move. And people always see the, the beach home, you know, and they think, well, flooding is affecting a beach home, big deal. Uh, but from around here, you, you know, that's it's, it's more than that. And helping decision makers, I know we, we talk to the, to the uh, city managers, assistant city managers, and, you know, vision heads, and they just say, how do you communicate this stuff to a city council, you know, so they can understand it. So we're, in fact, our next uh, event with all of them will be bringing in people that have, have successfully done that. <coughs> And finally, it is going to require regional coordination. And then the last pitch I'll put into the university people here is let's try and get our faculty working together. Thank you.